All right, well, technically it is really kind of like time to start. And we'll see how this works out. God, I'm small in that. Um, I am going to try and video, do video and audio recordings. Um, I will publish those hopefully within a day or two. So it'll give you just one more resource uh, to go back and either listen to or watch. Probably just listen to. Because if you watch, it's kind of slow. You can't. Well, of course, you know, when they're on YouTube, you can fast forward. It's like, I don't want to hear about that part. You just, I won't be able to answer questions. Uh, so, I don't know if you all, some of you may have noticed I sent out an email this morning saying uh, for the prototypes, they might like look in your text. <laughs> you know, your, your resources for this class, that textbook is actually good. I would make that the first one, especially since it's electronic. You can copy and paste. Not that that's your best choice in terms of learning, but the book has a lot of information in it, especially about something like TPN, which is weird because it has all these other components. It's got proteins. It's got glucose. It's got amino acids. It's got electrolytes and may even have other additives. So it, when you do a drug search on TPN, that's why Googling on it came up. A lot of you emailed me and said, I'm, I'm Googling TPN and I, I can't find like what its generic name is. Well, there is no generic name. Um, and, you know, what its contraindications and stuff are. It, you have to think of, if you're looking at, at, at those aspects, you have to think about it in terms of what its components are. So this is, you know, somebody is getting a bunch of electrolytes being replaced in their TPN. You need to think about electrolytes. So are they going to, you know, are they going to get hyper or hypo, uh, kalemic, calcemic, whatever? Um, the sugar, you know, if it's if it is TPN, which means it's going through a central line, then it's going to be at least 10% glucose. It could be as high as 20, because they tend to balance out the formula with glucose. So they'll, you know, they'll they'll do the 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 labs, the nutritional requirements figure out what the patient needs, and then whatever else they need to add in, they'll add sugar. That's kind of how they fill out the bag. So I, I highly recommend you start out with your textbook. Next would be the drug guides that most of you may have bought, you know, the little, you know, Mosby or whatever, uh, because those also are really good resources on things like contraindications. If they are the IV drug guides, they will tell you about compatibility. Can you can you mix two IV drugs at the Y site? What's the Y site? Anybody know? If you read in a drug thing that it's compatible at the Y site, I saw it almost a hand. Go for it. Yeah, there's a, it'll be a port like right down here, or maybe it's even up here. But the point is, when you're using a Y site, you're actually commingling those two drugs. They're running together. So if it's a heparin drip. And normal saline, you can do that. If it's a heparin drip and much of anything else, you probably can't. Um, and if it's TPN, you never mix anything with TPN. TPN, you really want to have at least two lumens on um, the catheter. Not that that's in, under your control. If the doctor puts in a single lumen catheter, that's what you live with. But you complain a lot. So let's talk about TPN. I, I took a look at, you know, I, I had a chance this morning to take a look at some of the people's, some of your responses. And in general, they're looking good. Um, were there questions that you would like to ask? The last class actually had a whole bunch of questions. Oh, good. We're starting out well. I like questions. Well, it's not like that. Yeah. Okay. What do you mean by the off formula? Oh, that was, somebody else asked exactly that. What's off um off-label use. TPN doesn't really have off-label use because it just doesn't apply to TPN. <laughs> Do you all remember what the, uh, neurotin or gabapentin are? Anybody remember? You should have heard about this last year. You might even have administered it in the hospital. Nobody remembers? Nobody's ever... Anybody hear of gabapentin? Neurontin? Is 
It's an antidepressant. It is used as, uh, as an anticonvulsant. What else is it used for? How about neuropathic pain? That is started out as an off-label use. Because when the, manu the drug manufacturer invented gabapentin, they were inventing an antidepressant. It was just along the way that they kind of noticed that, that these people also had the, you know, their, um, their neuropathic pain, chronic pain, was better controlled. When the drug was first released, the, the standard uses that were approved by the FDA were for as an antidepressant and an anticonvulsant. They didn't say anything about using it for pain management. So when the doctors chose to prescribe it as a pain control medication in the case of like diabetic neuropathy, that was off-label. There was nothing on the label that talked about dosing, purpose, side effects, or anything else using it in, in that mode. Does that help? It's a really good question. And a lot of drugs do have off-label use. Can a doctor, can a doctor, can a, can a doctor, you can see I'm, I'm already fading and it's only, well, it's 6, 6.05. Um, can a doctor prescribe a drug pretty much any way he or she likes? Actually, yes. That's within their scope. If they choose to do some weird dosing or whatever, they can do that. Now, if they're practicing in a group or, in a, you know, like at Kaiser, they might hear about it. They might have to justify it. But if they're in private practice, they can kind of do whatever they like. Can we do that? No. What? You're, you, let's say you're working on the med surge floor. Dr. Jones comes down. Everybody's Jones. Doctor, patient, I don't know. Dr. Jones comes in and says, this patient, you know, is patient's heart rate is, you know, 120. Blood pressure is 160 over 90. Uh, I'd like to give him five milligrams of metropolol, uh, metropolol IV push. So could you do that? Somebody else guess. <laughs> Can, can you give metropolol IV push on the floor? No, you can't. It's by policy, basically, but I, I would be surprised if you could find any hospital that would let you do that. So what is your answer to Dr. Jones? I'm sorry, doctor. I can't give that drug on this floor IV push. But you can. So the doctor can administer it. Hopefully you have a monitor on, you know, standby. And you're paying attention. Yeah. Why can the doctor give it? No, why can't we? Oh, because those drugs, you know, IV IV push metropolol can cause a profound drop in blood pressure and heart rate. And on a med surge floor, you don't want that happening. If you're in the ICU, you can give it. On the floor, you can't. So what you will learn in part as you progress through the program and, and progress through your careers, you'll find there's things you can do in the ED and in intensive care that can't be done on the floor. Oh, by the way, if you're an intensive care nurse and you float to the floor, can you give that drug? No, because it's a policy violation. That floor, you cannot administer that drug. It doesn't matter what your skills and training are. It's the policy that controls it. So I digress there, but um, good question. Off-label use, yeah. Considerations. My answer to that is maybe. And here's why it's maybe. It depends on the drug. TPN has a lot of teaching with it. You know what I mean? They've got electrolyte balance to be concerned about. You've got sugar management to be concerned about. There's things that the family and the patient need to know. So that's going to be a fairly long 
section on teaching, as well as nursing considerations. I mean, you as a nurse, when you're administering TPN, you need to be monitoring the, not the IV site, the central line site. You need to be looking for signs of sepsis or infection. You need to be looking for signs of hypo or hyperglycemia. I mean, those, that's your job. If you're giving normal saline, that's going to be pretty short teaching. You know, you're going to talk, if it's a CHF patient, you're going to have to expand on, you know, you look out for signs of fluid overload. Um, but it's isotonic. It, you know, it's innocuous, basically. It is still a drug, but technically. I'm sorry I couldn't give you a better answer, but it is one of those that is like, well, it depends. Well, here's, here's the deal. If you're submitting a Word document to me via Moodle, you can be a little more detailed if you like. But if you're writing it on an index card for yourself, you know, this is hard to read. And really the intent of this exercise in general was med cards. I do think med cards are useful. They just, to me, they're part of the clinical side of the class, not pharmacology. You do need to know these drugs, but the idea of a med card is I'm walking into the room to give the patient a drug, and oh my God, I don't remember what it does. And I need to teach the patient on it. I need to tell them what to look for, and I need to be telling myself what to look for. That was really the intent of a med card. With all the resources we have in the hospital now, which frankly did not exist 10 years ago, you needed med cards 10 years ago. Now. It's a learning exercise. I don't know that if I were a student now, I'd be carrying around the pocket of index cards that I had 10 years ago, because I can bring it up in the Pixis. I can bring it up on my smartphone. Why should I be carrying around this stuff? Except that that's actually faster, by the way. If you've got LASIKs and you can just flip to it, that's probably the quickest way to get there. So maybe the 20 most common drugs that you give, but you're gonna learn those pretty quickly. Other questions about TPN in particular? Anything that you learned about TPN? Yeah. Uh, is there any other names for TPN? No. TPN is TPN. That okay. is both as generic and. I remember, like, in the book, it says something about like, hyper alignment. Oh, hyper alimentation? Yeah. Yeah, that is actually a little bit different. Yeah. but So, aliment means that it's actually going to the digestive tract. Oh, did you? Well, you know, some companies actually have pre-mixed TPN that they distribute. So it's probably you're probably correct. I'm not going to say you're wrong. But like the stuff that comes out of the guy, the place in San Jose, that's all generic. It's just TPN. And it goes to, you know, 35 hospitals. How am I doing here? Time. Okay, quarter after. All right. Any other TPN questions? So TPN was a challenging drug because it's a combination of all these things as opposed to a single IV drug. So in the future when you're doing stuff like, you know, atropine or epinephrine, you're going to find the filling up that, that prototype is a little simpler in many ways. And start with the textbook. You're going to find, you probably have 95% per, of the information you need is available right there. Yeah. It depends on how much glucose it has in it. And that's a good, that's a good one to remember for the midterm uh, that's coming in a week and a half. You, know, you, 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 know, you do know that next Wednesday is a midterm in med surge. There might be a question like that on there. No, I think it's the following. It might, I, don't know, I don't remember if it, that's on there or not, but the concentration of glucose determines whether it's a central line or peripheral line. So what, do you remember what we talked about last week about the concentration? Somebody want to throw out a number? So if it's 10% or higher, it has to be a central line. If it's less than 10%, it can be a, through a peripheral. The preferred is still um, a central line because it can be much more concentrated and have actually, you know, more highly packed with nutrients and all that stuff. Um, Somebody mentioned in one of their things, you know, to look out for um, phlebitis. 
So phlebitis is not going to apply to TPN because it's a central line. Phlebitis is when you have a peripheral. And so if they were on PPN, peripheral parenteral nutrition, then you'd be certainly paying attention for phlebitis. But 99% of your patients are going to be, it's going to be a central line, a PIC line, something like that. They're almost the same. Yeah, until you're reading it and you're going, oh, that makes sense, that makes sense. They're pretty much the same, but then there's things that, little things that make a big difference. Exactly, and you know, that's the funny thing about nursing and drugs is little things make a big difference. I wouldn't put it past them. Okay. <laughs> Typically, in my experience, PPN is peripheral. TPN is central line. And, and let's do this. For the purposes of tests in my class, TPN goes through a central line. How's that? Okay. That's like the NCLEX hospital. You know what the NCLEX hospital is, don't you? Have you ever heard that term? That's the hospital that you're practicing in when you take the NCLEX. So when it asks... What is the gold standard for patient identification? Your answer is the photograph that's over their bed and in the chart. That's the gold standard for patient identification is a photograph. Kaiser, by the way, has adopted that. However, not everybody else has. So do you ever put a, a patient's uh, ID band on the bed rail? No. Mm -mm. So, the, and that's the danger of talking about the patient in 2205, because it may not be the patient that you had yesterday in 2205. Maybe somebody entirely different. So, anyway, shall we talk a little bit about med math? You remember how to review med math? Because you learned this all last year, right? Mm -hmm. So we can just blow right through this. Okay. I have it here somewhere. Did you, you all did read the things that said read before you come to class? Or you're not going to admit to it if you didn't? Oh, isn't that exciting? <laughs> oh, I didn't want to go back. I want to go forward. So dimensional analysis. You know what that you know what that word is all about? It says keep your units consistent. If you're dealing in milligrams and kilograms, you know, work always have units with your numbers because that's what will keep you from making massive mistakes. That's what it's really all about. Bless you. You're allergic to class? <laughs> I am, no. <laughs> So do I need to go through all this on a line-by-line -line basis? I'm seeing, no, uh, it's hot, I'm tired, it's the end of the day. Who can't do, well, no, I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> how can I, no, I can't ask that either. Okay, so how many milligrams are there in a gram? Yeah. How many micrograms are there in a milligram? One micrograms in a milligram. Yeah. Yeah, we love the metric system. It's really cool. How many nanograms in a microgram? How many picograms in a nanogram? Yeah, isn't that easy? Now we're down to like 10 to the minus fourth. Okay. Um, no, 10 to the minus sixth. Excuse me. Actually, it goes in threes. Ten to the minus ninth is where we got to. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So the thing is to make sure that your units are in sync with each other. Because if you think in grams and you're given milligrams, you may give them a little, like, thousand times more than they need. Probably most people aren't going to appreciate that. Especially the family when they sue you. So here's the deal. We have, we have an order that says give a quarter of a gram 
and we have 125 milligram tablets. So how do we set that up? We have, we, we ultimately, we want to know how many tablets are we going to give, right? Tablet is 125 milligrams. Now, if we multiply that by 1,000, we actually get how many... Is that right? It should be divided by 1,000. No, it is multiplied by 1,000. Okay, 125 milligrams times 1,000 is 0.125 grams. Although I didn't really set it up that way. I apologize. I was making changes to it because it was even more confusing before I started with it. Um, so a tablet is a quarter of a gram, uh, excuse me, an eighth of a gram. You do, you do know that 125th is an eighth of something. Not that you will ever hear it that way on, on a floor. But, you know, it's half of a quarter, so it's an eighth. But we don't deal in fractions because that's too confusing. So if a, if a tablet is 0.125 grams or 125 milligrams, all we did was move that decimal point three, you know, three to the, to the right. To the left. I'm having, having a moment. <laughs> and ultimately, what you're going to do is divide grams into grams. So I have, I have a, an order for 0.25 grams or 0.250 grams. Now what did I do wrong in all of these? Anybody see what's glaringly wrong with this setup here? I didn't put that preceding zero in each one of these. You're right. Absolutely. It should be 0 0.2. Anyway, uh, I did have it up there. So how many times does 0.125 go into 0.25? Twice. So we cancel out the grams. We end up with tabs times two. Okay. It's, you know, really, it doesn't get much harder than that. Unfortunately, we seem to be really good at convincing nurses that math is hard. And I think the, the thing that makes it hard for people is that um, they're all word problems. You know, you, you never get the... Multiply two times six and tell me the answer. It's, you have two tablets and you have to give it six times a day and what's the dose? So you got to get figure out, you know, what the, uh, dis the distractors are in there and just get it down to the essence of the problem. Melaril. They used to give a lot of Melaril when I was working in the psych unit back in 1969. It's an antipsychotic. And you probably will never give it, but it comes in a liquid. And you have, you know, the little container, sort of like in a, uh, you know, little dairy creamers, except now they're filled with melaril instead of creamer. And they have 30 milligrams per ml in those. They probably have like five mLs. And you got to figure out how you're going to give 50 milligrams. And you you really want to be cautious when you're... People get caught up in milligrams and milliliters, and they forget that they really need to be always, in essence, thinking about milligrams, even though they're going to administer a certain number of milliliters. If I tell you that the morphine in that vial has a one milligram per ml, and you have an order to give two milligrams, how much, what's the, vo you're going to give two milligrams of morphine, but what's the volume that you're going to drop? Two mls, right? However, that vial says you have one milligram in five mls, how much are you going to drop? Ten mls. Are you giving any more morphine in either case? It's always the same amount. So think about your drugs in terms of dose, not volume. So let's get back to the volume here because that's a problem. Um, so we, we do need to, since it's in a form that requires us to determine how many mLs will have the right number of milligrams in it, we're going to divide the, 30, the 50 milligrams, which is the dose we want to give, by the 30 milligrams that's a per ml that's in that little container. So we get out our syringe 
and we draw up. Well, we don't know how much to draw up, do we? So first we have to figure that out. Again, 30 into 50. Well, this time I didn't screw up with the zeros. There's no preceding zeros. But milligrams, so they both drop out. You get 30 into 50, which is times 1 ml, because that's the 30 is times 1 ml. And you end up with 1.66. Yeah. You know, it's a repeating decimal. Okay? But we know that we have to give 1.6 something mLs of uh, the melaryl so that they will get their 50 milligrams. So let me ask you a question. If you divide, if you multiply, now this is a good practice. When you get your answer, multiply it, you know, feed it back into the original equation. Make sure it comes back out with sort of like a number that makes sense. So if I say I have 30 milligrams per ml, if you multiply 30 times 1.7, what do you get? 51. Now, was the order for 51 milligrams? Okay. If you try and adjust it to 1.6, what are you going to give? 48. They're both wrong. Generally, rounding in nursing is a little weird. You will actually give the 1.7, unless you're on a pediatric unit or working in the critical care, in which case they'll try and give you something that gets you right on. Um, but with these oral meds, often that little bit of variance is, is actually okay. But that's the question is, you know, what's, what's, what's the right dose? Can you give 1.6666 mLs? What's, what's the tiniest volume you can actually measure accurately with a syringe? What's the, um, the, the precision that you can apply? If you think about a syringe, does it have markings at just 1 mL and 2 mLs? What, what's in between? Tenths of an mL, right? So could you give a hundredth of an mL? Could you, well, you might be able to, but could you measure it accurately? No, of course not. Now that I've told you that, I'm going to tell you that's actually not true. There are two kinds of syringes that actually measure in a hundredth of an mL. Anybody want to guess? Good. Great guess. Insulin syringes, which actually measure in units, a 100 unit syringe actually is 1 mL and it's marked in 100 units is happens to be a hundredth of an mL. Never use it that way. Anybody want to guess as to what the other kind of syringe is that actually is capable of that level of accuracy? Hmm? Uh, well, they don't have neonatal syringes actually that I'm aware of. They do it differently. But what about tuberculin? TB syringes. They're also 1 mL in hundred, 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 hundredths demarcation. But the truth is you never use them that way. You're still drawing up you know, with insulin. You're drawing up. That used to drive me crazy. You know, we'd, I'd have a lot of our patients, we'd be doing sugars like every four hours. So at midnight, I had to do a sugar on a patient. And they would be like, you know, one unit, you know, their, their, their blood sugar would be 101. And I'd have to give on the sliding scale, one unit of insulin out of a 100-unit syringe. We, we never could figure out if we actually gave them any, any syringe. Yeah? Is the reason that those syringes in particular measure that way because like, the difference in the amount of insulin would change the person's reaction? Oh, yeah. No, they're, yeah. Yeah, those, are, those are very, they need to be very accurately dosed. So you, you wouldn't draw that up in a 10 ml syringe. Mm -mm. You'd have a dead patient. What's a safe dose range? Remember we were talking about therapeutic index last week? Oh, yeah, you have a hand halfway up. Mm-hmm. 
Right. So on the low side, you're actually talking about the minimum dose that will have a therapeutic effect. And on the high side, it's just the maximum dose you give with, you know, without causing damage. Usually it's over 24 hours, so you, you know, you add up all the doses and figure out their body weight and, you know, how, however that drug is calculated. And although you probably should compare the orders for safe dose range, I think most of us assume that the computer has already done it. If I'm working in a pediatric unit, though, or a, neo a neo neonatal unit, well, I might pay a lot more attention to it. But on an adult unit, I'm probably going to... Most of us take, you know, the orders at face value. That's, that's the reality of the situation. Do I need to go over this in detail? You, you get this, right? Most you want to give in the day is that. Oh, that. Excuse me. And if you get under that, they're probably not getting uh, much of an effect out of it. And then you will also hear people talk about the alternative calculations, which is the dose, or, you know, the desired, what I have on hand, and then times the quantity, whether that quantity, again, is tablets or volume, mLs. That was a very handy, easy one to do. Let's see. Yeah, 30 kilograms. Kid weighs 30 kilograms. 66. Everything is in the hospital. Almost everything is done in metric. Although you may record weight. Weight may be recorded in pounds and then converted to metric. But really, you're just going to figure out you know, what's the dose? What's, what's the risk with that acetaminophen for the, that child? What organ can it damage? Liver, right. What's the high safe dose range for acetaminophen for an adult over 24 hours? It used to be different. It used to be higher. Well, that'd be per dose. That's per dose. Safe dose range over 24 hours would... Actually, I think it's 3,200 now. It used to be 4 grams. Why did they lower it? Why did the FDA lower the safe dose range for acetaminophen? They only did this a couple of years ago. What does everything you take over the counter have in it? That cold remedy, what does it have in it? Probably. When you look at the... You do look at the ingredients, don't you? <laughs> I would. <laughs> okay, so the hay fever medication, the stuffy nose medication, the nighttime cold medication, pretty much all have Tylenol and oil acetaminophen. What about Norco? What's the bulk of that tablet? Yeah, Vicodin. What's the bulk of that tablet? So you send somebody home on Norco, which is 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. Take, tell them to take two tablets five times a day, four times a day. You're right up to that 3,200. Oh, and by the way, they have a cold, so they're taking, you know, nighttime cold medication, what happens to them? We have a lot of people in liver failure because of acetaminophen. They're overdosing. Anyway, look at the labels. Really? No, it's, I'm serious. I mean, I, uh, there's certain drugs I really can't take. And I so I, I'm very careful in that regard on over-the-counter stuff. I actually do pay attention to what's in it, because there's certain drugs that I don't do well with. Oh, and we, we're done counting there, okay. Shall we move on to IV drugs? What time is it? Oh, I got 20 minutes, right? More or less? Well, actually, it's right here. 
<laughs> but it's also up there. Yes, I know. But that's to the back of my head. I have trouble seeing them. My children were sure that I could see out of the back of my head, but I really can't. <laughs> uh, we'll do a slideshow again. So IV solutions, rate calculations. So when we're talking about this, where it says daily maintenance fluids, replace prior deficits, deficits, current losses, are we talking about epinephrine? No, we're probably talking about normal saline, lactated ringers. So this is a little misleading because we give a lot of IV drugs and none of them are about these three things. But if you're talking about crystalloids, again, normal saline, lactated ringers, D5, we're talking about managing you know, either electrolytes or fluid balance in the body. Did I show, oh, I showed this in MedSearch last week, right? Didn't we see that slide last week? No, but this was in MedSearch one. I hope so. I could have sworn I showed this last week in one of the classes. Oh, I know where it was. It was in, in Farm 3. And they're like, oh, God, you're showing us again. <laughs> but we did talk about, like, the special case of dextrose yeah. with yeah. stuff. Because dextrose, once it gets into the bloodstream, gets, gets metabolized. It gets consumed. So it does change in the bloodstream. But otherwise, you know, LR. And you will hear it. In the hospital, it will be NS, LR, half NS, D5. They don't call it lactated ringers. Yeah. What kind of Okay. That's a good one. It's, it's basically the electrolyte replacement for an alcoholic, as well as it will have vitamins. And uh, what is it, B12, I think, in particular, because they have a profound D B12 deficit, which is one of the reasons they go into DTs. I have no idea. <laughs> hey, at least I'm honest. I don't know. Uh, but you, the banana bags are the ones that go to the people that are in DTs or about to, or concerned for going into DTs. And so they're trying to do both electrolyte and vitamin replacement. Because typically, they've been not nutritionally sound in their diet. They may need those hard-boiled eggs and drinking the shots, you know. <laughs> or whatever you've seen or read about, I don't know. Please, as I understand it, a lot of you haven't quite reached 21 yet. You do know that there's an epidemic of alcohol poisoning in people in your age group, where they go out to go drink it for the first time, and they they get they're doing that drinking contest, and they sh you know they do a, a fifth of vodka and they die. I don't want to see that happen to any of you. Please don't do that. It's it will kill you. Now the guy that's been drinking a quart a day for 20 years, he won't. But that's because he's accommodated his system to being able to of course everything else is trashed but he can actually tolerate or she can tolerate that level you can't it'll kill you when we talk about IV flow rates it's always in general milliliters per hour it's that simple we don't we don't we don't do really sophisticated at least the, the machines don't they at least report it how many mLs per hour they're delivering. Even in the ICU, when you're doing micrograms per kilogram per minute, when you set it up on the pump, it will tell you how many mLs per hour they're giving. And you probably even record, well, you record it both ways because it's an INO. <laughs> the time this really comes into play is when you're doing gravity. Where, where do they do Gravity. Where, what unit does, use, does gravity drips all the time? OB? You think so? Look, in the hospital, they use pumps everywhere. Except maybe in the ED. A lot of times the ED, they'll hang a bag. And they will count drops. 
I've also seen them do it in the OR, which is a little wacko because they're giving them some really potent drugs down there, but, you know, surgeons are off on their own tangent. Um, so the thing you have to know, you know, in, you, you, you may remember back to, you know, early math, algebra stuff back in the, you know, sixth and seventh grade. If you have three variables and only one unknown, you can solve the problem. If you have three variables and two unknowns, you cannot solve the problem. So with drip rates, I mean with, you know, with an IV drip, you know what you have to give in terms of milligrams or or if it's a fluid, perhaps milliliters. This might be the one time we, if we're doing it, you know, normal saline, we actually are talking volume here, not, not dose, because there's no milligrams of normal saline. But if it's a manual setup, you also have to know how many drops in that drip chamber does it take to make a milliliter. And that's the drip factor. Did, did you all talk about that in MedSurge 1? Okay, good. So now you know it. Drip factors range anywhere from 5 to like 20 on quotes standard to me. Probably the most common are 15 to 20 drops per ml. But if you're going to figure out, okay, 100 mLs per hour. How do you approach that problem? What's the first thing you probably want to do? I would do that, yes. So what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to divide by 60, right? Because there's 60 drops. I mean, 60 drops. 60 drops in an hour. 60, 60 minutes in an hour. Because it just makes it easier. You want to get everything in the minutes because your drip factors, or drop, you know, the drip factor, no, that's not in minutes either, uh, is in mLs, but your, <clears throat> yeah, it's just easier. To, the numbers are easier to manage if you're dealing with 60 with minutes, because ultimately you're going to be counting those drops to figure out the rate. And you probably don't want to stand there for an hour counting drops, although it would be very accurate. But you probably won't have that much time. So if I tell you that the drip factor is 10, and you want to run it at 100 mLs per hour, you're going to divide 100 by 60, what's that? Is not another one of those repeating decimals, like 1.66666. And it takes, where am I here? It takes 10 of those to make an ml. So 1.6 times 10 is. 16, right? Although we're going to round it up to 17. So it takes 17 drops to make 10 mLs. All right. 17 drops per minute to run at 100 mLs an hour. So you're actually going to stand there and count drops. One, two, it's not a very fast drip, by the way. It's like it's a drop every f more or less four seconds, a little bit less than that. I've done that. Sometimes you have to. It's boring. How long are you, st <laughs> this is an NCLEX question, how long do you count the drops? 15 seconds? A minute. For the NCLEX, it's a minute. The ED might be 30 seconds. You might. What do you mean, how long do you count? Well, you're, you're saying you're going to count 17 drops over a minute, but it's a really busy day. So, how many drops, how long are you going to stand there for the whole minute and count 17 drops? Well, you're standing there and time's running and things are going maybe at 30 seconds. You say, well, I got like between eight and nine drops. Good to go. So, the question is it's like taking a pulse. Do you assess it for 15 seconds and multiply it by four? 
do you take it for 30 seconds and multiply by 2, or do you stand there for a minute if you're doing a manual pulse? For the NCLEX, it's a minute. <laughs> In practice, it might be 30 seconds. I wouldn't do 15 because, you know, particularly if they have an irregular heart rate, which a lot of them do, you're just not going to get an, an accurate number. Um, but those are just practice. You know, what? how are you going to practice as a nurse? What are you going to do to make sure your patient's safe? Anyway. But this is really straightforward stuff. What about, have you heard of a micro drip set? So this will be used like in a pediatric unit or maybe again in the if you in the critical care if you have drugs that are you know really potent if you want the vasoactive those have a, a, a drip factor of 60 drops per ml so now let's see if we're going to count that for 30 seconds that's 180 drops if it's running that fast of course usually the micro drip again the, the you know you're going to be running at rates where you're still What's the f what do you think the fastest you can count drops is? How many drops can you count in a minute easily? Hmm? So maybe up to 120. But after that, your accuracy is going to really fall off. Because it starts going, <laughs> it's like, it's just running. Oh, yeah. You, you don't really want to be counting stuff much Really, once you get over, you know, 50 or 60 drops per minute, that's a fairly fast drip, at least on a manual. There's nothing worse than hanging a drip, hanging a bag, 500 NS, supposed to run over an hour, and you come back 15 minutes later, and it's empty. It's all in the patient. Now you hope that their lungs and heart are good, because otherwise they're going to go into, they could go into flash pulmonary edema. One of the most terrifying experiences I ever had was a patient coming up with flash pulmonary edema. We already talked about that. We're good to go. Do you all, have you ever heard of that term, flash pulmonary edema? So I had a, I got a call from the cath lab. I was, you know, I had just come on shift. And they're giving me a report. They had just finished this patient. And she says, well, you know, she's, she has a little you know, short of breath. We just put her on a non-rebreather, blah, 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 blah. Gave her, you know, a half a liter of this, and and we're coming up in the elevator. So the cath lab was just two floors down and directly at the elevator, and we had a special elevator that came straight to the ICU. That elevator opens. I come down. She's on the gurney, and she's trying to climb out of the gurney. And I looked at the intensivist, and I said, we need to intubate her, which happily they did. She would have been dead in about 15 minutes. Because what happened was all that fluid just went straight to her lungs. And she was drowning, and she knew it. She knew she was dying. And that makes people really panicky, <laughs> you know. So once we sedated her, got the intubate, she was fine two hours later. You know, we gave her Lasix and stuff and supported her for that time. But it's a terrifying experience to watch flash pulmonary. It's, it's really scary because they know they're dying, and so do you. So what are you going to do to keep them alive, you know, anyway? Um, Wednesday, we have a quiz. Next Monday, we're all off. At least I'm not coming here next Monday. Um, any questions before we all run out the door? You have a question. It'll be very similar. You will, as I said, there's really no time limit on it. I hope that you don't take too long because we have things to talk about. It'll be like 10 questions. Don't miss more than one. So since there's no time limit, those that need extra time, just take the time they need. Okay. Have a great Tuesday. <laughs> See you Wednesday.